my darling. Welcome back to our reading of Peter Pan. I hope that you are doing well and that you have time to relax and enjoy. Today's reading picks up with chapter three. Come away. Come away. For a moment, after Mr. and Mrs. Darling left the house, the night lights by the beds of the three children continued to burn clearly. They were awfully nice little night lights, and one cannot help wishing that they could have kept awake to see Peter. But Wendy's light blinked and gave such a yawn that the other two yawned also and before they could close their mouths, all of the three went out. There was another light in the room now, a thousand times brighter than the night lights, and in the time we have taken to say this, it had been in all the drawers in the nursery, looking for Peter's shadow, rummaging the wardrobe and turning every pocket inside out. It was not really a light. It made this light by flashing out so quickly. But when it came to rest for a second, you saw that it was a fairy, no longer than your hand, but still growing. It was a little girl called Tinkerbell, exquisitely gowned in a skeleton leaf cut low and square, through which her figure could be seen to the best advantage. She was slightly inclined to having a plump but beautiful hourglass figure. A moment after the fairy's entrance, the window was blown open by the breathing of the little stars, and Peter dropped in. He had carried Tinkerbell part of the way, and his hand was still messy with the fairy dust. Tinkerbell, he called softly, after making sure the children were asleep. Tink, where are you? She was in a jug for the moment, and liking it extremely. She had never been in a jug before. Oh, do come out of that jug and tell me, do you know where they hid my shadow? The loveliest tinkle, as of golden bells, answered him. It is the fairy language. You ordinary children can never hear it. But if you were to hear it, you would know that you had heard it once before. Tink said that the shadow was in the big box. She meant the chest of drawers, and Peter jumped at the drawers scattering their contents to the floor with both hands. In a moment, he had recovered his shadow, and in his delight, he forgot that he had shut Tinkerbell up in the drawer. If he thought at all, but I don't believe he ever thought, it was that he and his shadow, when brought near each other, would join like drops of water, and when they did not, he was appalled. He tried to stick it on with soap from the bathroom, but that also failed. A shudder passed through Peter, and he sat on the floor and began to cry. His sobs woke Wendy, and she sat up in bed. She was not alarmed to see a stranger crying on the nursery floor, Rather, she was pleasantly interested. Boy, she said courteously, why are you crying? Peter could be quite polite as well, having learned the grand manner at fairy ceremonies, and he rose and bowed to her beautifully. She was much pleased and bowed beautifully back to him from her bed. What's your name, he asked. Wendy, Maura, Angela, darling, she replied with some satisfaction. 
Tell me what's your name? Peter Pan, he replied. She was sure already that this must be Peter, but it did seem a comparatively short name. Is that all? she asked. Yes, he said rather sharply. He felt for the first time that it was indeed a short name. I'm so sorry, said Wendy. It doesn't matter, replied Peter. She asked where he lived. Second to the right, said Peter, and then straight on until morning. What a funny address. Peter had a sinking feeling. For the first time, he felt that perhaps it was indeed a funny address. No, it isn't, he said. I mean, said Wendy nicely, remembering that she was hostess. Is that what they put on the letters? He wished she had not mentioned letters. I don't get any letters, he said. But your mother gets letters, right? I don't have a mother, he said angrily. Not only had he no mother, but he had not the slightest desire to have one. He thought them very overrated persons. Wendy, however, felt at once that she was in the presence of a tragedy. Oh, Peter, no wonder you're crying, she said, and she got out of bed and ran to him. I wasn't crying about mothers, he said rather indignantly. I was crying because I can't get my shadow to stick back on. And besides, I wasn't crying. Your shadow has come off, she asked. Yes. Then Wendy saw the shadow on the floor, looking so draggled, and she was frightfully sorry for Peter. How awful, she said, but she could not help smiling when she saw that he had been trying to stick it on with soap. How exactly like a boy. Fortunately, she knew at once what to do. It must be sewn on, she said, with just a little patronization. What's sewn, he asked. You are dreadfully ignorant, she replied. No, I'm not, he said. But she was exulting in his ignorance. I shall sew it on for you, my little man, she said, though he was as tall as herself. And she got out her housewife's sewing bag and sewed the shadow onto Peter's foot. I dare say this will hurt a little, she warned him. Oh, I shan't cry, said Peter, who was already of the opinion that he had never cried in his life. And he clenched his teeth, and he did not cry. And soon his shadow was behaving properly, though still a little creased. Perhaps I should have ironed it, Wendy said thoughtfully. But Peter, boy-like, was indifferent to appearances, and he was now jumping about in the wildest glee. Alas, he had already forgotten that he owed his bliss to Wendy. He thought he had attached the shadow himself. Oh, how clever I am, he growled rapturously. Oh, the cleverness of me. It is humiliating to have to confess that this conceit of Peter was one of his most fascinating qualities. To put it with brutal frankness, there never was a cockier boy. But for the moment, Wendy was shocked. You conceited braggart, she exclaimed with frightful sarcasm. Of course, I did nothing. You did a little, said Peter carelessly and he continued to dance. A little, she replied, with pride. If I am of no use, I can at least withdraw. And she sprang in the most dignified way into bed and covered her face with the blankets. To induce her to look up, he pretended to be going away. And when this failed, he sat on the end of the bed and tapped her gently with his foot. Wendy, he said, don't withdraw. I can't help crowing, Wendy, when I'm pleased with myself. 
still she would not look up, though she was listening eagerly. Wendy, he continued, in a voice that no woman has ever yet been able to resist. Wendy, one girl is more used than twenty boys. Now, Wendy was every inch a woman, though there were not very many inches, and she peeped out of her bed. Do you really think so, Peter? Yes, I do. Well then, I think that's perfectly sweet of you, she declared, and I'll get up again. And she sat with him on the side of the bed. She also said she would give him a kiss if he liked, but Peter did not know what she meant, and yet he held out his hand expectantly. Surely you know what a kiss is, she said, aghast. I shall know when you give me one, he replied stiffly. And not to hurt his feelings, she gave him a thimble. Now, said he, shall I give you a kiss? And she replied with a slight primness, if you please. She made herself rather cheap by inclining her face towards him, but he merely dropped an acorn button into her hand. Still slightly surprised, she slowly returned her face to where it had been before and said nicely that she would wear his kiss on a chain around her neck. It was lucky that she did put on that chain, for afterwards it would save her life. When people in our set are introduced, it is customary for them to ask each other's age, and so Wendy, who always liked to do the correct thing, asked Peter how old he was. It was not really a happy question to ask him. It was like an examination paper that asks grammar when what you want is to be asked about the kings of England. I don't know, he replied uneasily, but I think I am quite young. He really knew nothing about it. He had suspicions, of course, but he said at a venture, Wendy, I ran away the day I was born. Wendy was surprised, of course, but interested and she indicated in the charming drawing-room manner by a touch on her nightgown that he should sit nearer to her. It was because I heard father and mother, he explained in a low voice. They were talking about what I was to be when I became a man. He was getting agitated now, as he explained. I don't want ever to be a man, he said with passion. I want always to be a little boy and to have fun. So I ran away to Kensington Gardens and I lived a long, long time with the fairies. She gave him a look of the most intense admiration and she thought it was because he had run away, but it really was because he knew fairies. Wendy had lived such a home life that to know fairies struck her as quite delightful. She poured out questions about them, and to his surprise, for they were rather a nuisance to him, getting in his way and so on, and indeed he sometimes had to give them a spanking. Still, he liked them on the whole, and he told her about the beginning of fairies. You see, Wendy, when the first baby laughed for the first time, its laugh broke into a thousand pieces, and they all went skipping about, and that was the beginning of fairies. This really was tedious talk, but being a stay-at-home, Wendy liked it, and so he went on good-naturedly. There ought to be one fairy for every boy and girl. Ought to be, she asked, isn't there? No. You see, children know such a lot now. They soon don't believe in fairies. And every time a child says, I don't believe in fairies, there is a fairy somewhere. 
but falls down dead. Really, he thought they had now talked enough about fairies, and it struck him that Tinkerbell was keeping very quiet. I can't think of where she has gone to, Peter said, rising, and he called Tink by name. Wendy's heart went fluttering with a sudden thrill. Peter, she cried, clutching him. You don't mean to tell me that there is a fairy in this room. She was here just now, he said impatiently. You don't hear her, do you? I lost her. They both listened. The only sound I hear, said Wendy, is like a little tinkle of bells. Well, that's stink. That's the fairy language. I think I hear her too. The sound came from the chest of drawers, and Peter made a merry face. No one could ever look quite so merry as Peter, and the loveliest of gurgles was his laugh. He had his first laugh still. Wendy, he whispered gleefully, I do think I shut her up in this drawer. He rushed over and let out poor Tink, and she flew about the nursery, screaming with fury. Hey now, Tinkerbell, you shouldn't say such things, Peter retorted. Of course, I am very sorry, but how could I know you were in the drawer? Wendy was not listening to him. Oh, Peter, she cried. If she would only stand still and let me see her. Fairies hardly ever stand still, he said. But for one moment, Wendy saw the romantic figure come to rest on the cuckoo clock. Oh, she's lovely, she cried, though Tink's face was still distorted with angry passion. Tink, Peter said gently, this lady says she wishes you were her fairy. Tinkerbell answered insolently. Well, what did she say, Peter? He had to translate. She is not very polite. She says you are a great, huge, ugly girl, and that she is my fairy only. He tried to argue with Tink. You know you can't be my fairy, Tink, because I am a gentleman and you are a lady. To this... Tink replied in these words, You silly donkey. And she disappeared into the bathroom. She is quite a common fairy, Peter explained apologetically. She is called Tinkerbell because she mends the pots and kettles. She is a tinkerer, a tin worker. They were together in the armchair by this time, and Wendy plied him with more questions. If you don't live in Kensington Gardens now, sometimes I do still, he replied. But where do you live mostly, she asked. With the Lost Boys. Who are the Lost Boys, Peter? They are the children who fall out of their preambulators when their nurse is looking the other way. If they are not claimed in seven days, they are sent far away to the Neverland, to defray expenses. I am captain. Oh, what fun that must be. Yes, said cunning Peter. But we are rather lonely. You see, we have no female companionship. Why are none of the others girls? Oh, well, girls, you know, are much too clever to fall out of their prams. This flattered Wendy immensely, I think, she said. It's perfectly lovely the way you talk about girls. John there just despises us. For reply, Peter rose and kicked John out of bed, blankets and all, in one kick. This seemed to Wendy rather forward for a first meeting, and she told him with spirit that he was not captain in her house. However, John was fast asleep, and he continued to sleep so placidly on the floor that she allowed him to remain there. And I know you meant to be kind, she said, relenting, so you may give me a kiss now. 
for the moment she had forgotten his ignorance about kisses. I thought you would want it back, he said a little bitterly, and he offered to return her thimble. Oh dear, said Wendy nicely. I didn't mean a kiss. I mean a thimble. What's that? It's like this, she said, and she kissed him on the cheek. Funny, said Peter gravely. Now shall I give you a thimble? Only if you wish to, said Wendy, though she kept her head steady. Peter thimbled her, and almost immediately she screeched. What is it, Wendy? It was exactly as if someone were pulling my hair. Well, that must have been Tink. I never knew her so naughty before. And indeed, Tink was darting about, using offensive language. She says she will do that to you, Wendy, every time I give you a thimble. But why? Why, Tink, he asked. Again, Tink replied, You silly donkey. Peter could not understand why, but Wendy understood, and she was just slightly disappointed when he admitted he came to the nursery window, not to see her, but to listen to stories. You see, Peter admitted, I don't know any stories. None of the lost boys know any stories. How perfectly awful, said Wendy. Do you know, Peter asked, why swallows build in the eaves of houses? It is to listen to the stories. Oh, Wendy. Your mother was telling you such a lovely story. Which story was that? she asked. About the prince who couldn't find the lady who wore the glass slipper, he replied. Peter, said Wendy, that was Cinderella, and he found her, and they lived happily ever after. Peter was so glad that he rose from the floor where they had been sitting and hurried to the window. Well, wait, where are you going, she cried, to tell the other boys. Don't go, Peter, she entreated. I know so many stories. Those were her precise words, so there can be no denying that it was she who first tempted him. He came back to her, and there was a greedy look in his eyes now, which ought to have alarmed her, but it did not. Oh, the stories I could tell to the boys, he cried. And then Peter gripped her and began to draw her towards the window. Let me go, she ordered him. Wendy, please come with me and tell the other boys. Of course, she was very pleased to be asked, but she said, Oh dear, I can't. Think of mummy. Besides, I can't fly. I'll teach you he responded. Wendy smiled over at Peter lovingly. Oh, how lovely it is to fly. Peter looked at her. I'll teach you how to jump on the wind's back, and then away we go. Oh, she exclaimed rapturously. Wendy, Wendy, when you are sleeping in your silly bed, you might be flying about with me, saying funny things to the stars. Oh, she responded. And Wendy, there are mermaids. Mermaids with tails? Such long tails. Oh, cried Wendy, to see a mermaid. He had become frightfully cunning. Wendy, he said, how we should all respect you. She was wriggling her body in distress. It was quite as if she were trying to remain on the nursery floor. But he had no pity for her. Wendy, he said, slyly. You could tuck us in at night. Oh, really? None of us has ever been tucked in at night. She smiled over at him and held out her arms. And you could darn our clothes and make pockets for us. None of us has any pockets. Well, how could she resist? Of course, it's awfully fascinating, she cried. P. 
Peter, would you teach John and Michael to fly too? If you like, he said indifferently. And she ran to John and Michael, and she shook them. Wake up, she cried. Peter Pan has come, and he is going to teach us to fly. John rubbed his eyes sleepily. Then I shall get up, he said. Of course, he was on the floor already. Hello, he said. I am up. Michael was up by this time also. He looked wide awake now, with bright and shining eyes. Peter suddenly held up his hand to silence them. Their faces assumed the awful craftiness of children listening for sounds from the grown-up world. All was still as salt. Then everything was right. But no, it wasn't. Everything was wrong. Nana, who had been barking distressfully all evening, was quiet now. It was her silence they had heard. Out with the light! Hide, quick! cried John, taking command for the only time throughout their whole adventure. And thus, when Liza entered, holding Nana, the nursery seemed quite its old self, very dark, and you would have sworn you heard its three wicked inmates breathing angelically as they slept. They were doing it artfully from behind the window curtains. Liza was in a bad temper, for she was mixing the Christmas puddings in the kitchen, and she had been drawn from them, with a raisin still stuck to her cheek. She thought the best way of getting a little quiet was to take Nana to the nursery for a moment, but in custody, of course. There, you suspicious brute, she said, not sorry that Nana was in disgrace. They are perfectly safe, you see. Every one of our little angels sound asleep in bed. Just listen to their gentle breathing. Here, Michael, encouraged by his success, breathed so loudly that they were nearly detected. Nana knew that kind of breathing, and she tried to drag herself out of Liza's clutches. But Liza was dense. No more of this, Nana, she said sternly, pulling her out of the room. I warn you, if you bark again, I shall go straight for Master and Mrs., and bring them home from the party. And then, oh, won't you be whipped? She tied the unhappy dog up outside again. But do you think Nana ceased to bark? Bring Master and Mrs. home from the party. Why, that was just what Nana wanted. Do you think she cared whether she was whipped, so long as she knew her charges were safe? Unfortunately, Liza returned to her puddings, and Nana, seeing that no help would come from her, strained and strained at her chain until at last she broke it. She ran down the street, to the dining room of number 27, and she flung her paws up to heaven in her most expressive way of making a communication. Mr. and Mrs. Darling knew at once that something terrible was happening in the nursery, and without a goodbye to their hostess, they rushed into the street. But it was now ten minutes since three scoundrels had been breathing behind the curtains and Peter Pan can do a great deal in ten minutes. We now return to the nursery. It's all right, John announced, emerging from his hiding place. I say, Peter, can you really fly? Instead of troubling to answer him, Peter flew around the room, taking the mantelpiece on the way. Well, how topping, said John and Michael together. How sweet, cried Wendy. Yes, I'm sweet. Aren't I sweet, said Peter, forgetting his manners again. It looked delightfully easy, and they tried it first from the floor and then from the beds, but they always went down instead of up. I say, Peter, how do you do it? asked John, rubbing his knee. He was quite a practical boy. 
You have to think lovely, wonderful thoughts, Peter explained. And your thoughts lift you up into the air. He showed them again. But you're so fast, said John. Could you do it more slowly for us again? Peter did it, both slowly and quickly. I've got it now, Wendy, cried John. But soon he found he had not. Not one of them could fly an inch. Even though Michael was in words of two syllables, and Peter did not know A from Z. Of course, Peter had been trifling with them, for no one can fly unless the fairy dust has been blown on him. Fortunately, as we have mentioned, one of his hands was covered in fairy dust, and he blew some on each of them with the most superb results. Now just wiggle your shoulders this way, he said, and let go. They were all on their beds, and gallant Michael let go first. He did not quite mean to let go, but he did, and immediately he flew across the room. I flew, he screamed, while still in midair. John let go, and met Wendy near the bathroom. Oh, lovely. Oh, ripping. Look at me, look at me. They were not nearly so elegant as Peter. They could not help kicking a little, but their heads were bobbing against the ceiling, and there was almost nothing so delicious as that. Peter gave Wendy a hand first, but had to desist. Tink was so jealous. Up and down they went, and round and round. Heavenly was Wendy's word. I say, cried John, why shouldn't we all go out now? Of course, it was to this that Peter had been luring them. Michael was ready. He wanted to see how long it took him to fly one billion miles, but Wendy hesitated. Mermaids, said Peter again. I guess, said Wendy, and there are pirates, said Peter again. Pirates, cried John. He seized his Sunday hat. Well, we must go at once. It was just at this moment that Mr. and Mrs. Darling hurried with Nana from house number 27. They ran into the middle of the street to look up at the nursery window, and yes, it was still shut, but the room was ablaze with light, and the most heart-gripping sight of all, they could see in shadow on the curtain three little figures in night attire, circling round and round, not on the floor, but in the air. Wait, it wasn't three figures, it was four. In a tremble, they opened the street door. Mr. Darling would have rushed upstairs, but Mackenzie Darling signed to him to go softly. She even tried to make her heart go softly. Would they reach the nursery in time? If so, how delightful for them, and we shall all breathe a sigh of relief. But there would be no story in that case. On the other hand, if they are not in time, a solemnly promise that all will come right in the end was made. They would have reached the nursery in time had it not been that the little stars were watching them. Once again, the stars blew the window open. That smallest star of all called out, Cave, Peter. Then Peter knew that there was not a moment to lose. Come, he cried, and soared out at once into the night. He was followed by John and Michael and Wendy. Mr. and Mrs. Darling and Nana rushed into the nursery too late. The birds had flown away. This concludes Chapter 3 of Peter Pan. Thank you for listening, my darling. Have very sweet and creepy dreams. Good night.